By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are back at the Often Troll Cup and guess what? We have reached the semi-finals. How exciting is that, right? Like that is just... I'm so looking forward to this. So the top four match, semi-finals, and in the top four, we have an underpowered deck. Yes, you heard it correctly, an underpowered deck. And it is mono green. Well, actually it's green with a modest black splash. It's inspired by the decks by Dave Firth Bart, but this is Rasmus playing the deck today, and uh, he's doing a phenomenal job, right? Top four. I can't wait to show you his deck, do the deck decks. He is taking on uh, Alex, Alex from the Netherlands, and he is playing the deck. And, you know, the deck in the semifinals is as to be kind of expected, but wait till you see his deck photo. He's got an insane collection of altars. It is a beautiful, beautiful deck. So take a moment to also check out that deck deck, because then you can see the deck photo. It is, it is stunning. He's got such a beautiful collection. Now, before I jump into the deck decks, of both of these decks, I would first like to point out that as always, you can also choose to go straight to the games. The easiest way to do this is by checking out the description below because there you'll find several timestamps. One of the timestamps reads MTG Games. Click on there, it'll take you straight to those matches. And also, you can find more information in the description about the rules of this tournament. We're pay, uh, playing according to the Swedish old school rules. And you can also find more information about the Often Troll Cup. Maybe you want to join us next year. Check out the info below because there you can find out how you can connect with the Often Troll Cup organizers. Okay, now that you're fully informed, I'm going to start with the deck text. I'm going to start with the deck of Rasmus. Let's take a look at his mono green slash little bit of black salt over there. Let's take a look. And here we see the list of Rasmus. So this is underpowered, top four. I mean, it's it's amazing. Uh, this is a mono green list, right? Kind of like stumpy green, but it's got a few black cards in it and it has some interesting choices. Maybe let's first focus on the interesting choices in green because he is not going for the Urnum Jin. The Urnum Jin is a card you see a lot in these brews because you can play Ice Storm if you have some ramp in the form of a Lana or Elves, for example. You can play an Ice Storm turn two, then turn three, you can play an Urnum, which is like a four or five powerhouse and you can put some pressure on your opponent. But this type of deck chooses a different route. And apparently that route is super successful because it's in the top four. Uh, this deck is choosing not to play with Urnum. Instead, it's gonna play two city in a bottle's main. So it's very anti-Arabian Nights in that perspective. It's also playing with the Demonic Tutor. Now remember, if you play a Demonic Tutor and you play against like a heavy Arabian Nights deck, it's almost like playing with three city in a bottles instead. And of course, city in a bottle is not just good against the Arabian Nights creatures. It's also great against like the city of brasses. A lot of five color good stuff decks need the city of brass to have the mana that they need to cast their stuff. And you kind of break that uh, off with your City in a Bottle. So City in a Bottle could be a key card here. We'll of course have to look at the deck of Alex first to see if he plays with City, uh, City uh, of Brass. I think he does. So this could be a really good card. We also see some other black cards in the form of a Terror. So Terror does something that you know Green is very bad at and that is kind of killing colored creatures because you have uh, your Crumble. Crumble is really good against artifacts, but you know, let's say your opponent with all the power in these decks casts like a turn one Sarah Angel. I mean, it's very possible. Everybody here plays with power. They play with, you know, Black Lotus and all that stuff and craziness. So they cast a uh, Sarah Angel turn one. What are you gonna do when you're in green? It's super tough, but black gives you the access to terror. Terror kind of solves that problem for you. He's also playing with one Drain Life here in the deck. Which again, I mean, it's pretty funny, right? He's got Elves of the Deep Shadow. He's got, um, you know, four Bayou. So he can make some black mana, but not that much. He's not playing Dark Ritual. He's not playing City of Brass. You know, black is not a big color in his deck. He's just playing with these four cards of black. But still, Drain Life can be good because with this type of deck, you put really early pressure on your opponent with all those little creatures, right? The Scripps Prize, the Lanower Elves, Spitting Slug, which is in here three off, I believe. We've got four uh, Argovian Pixies. So, you know, so you're putting pressure on your opponent. But the thing with green is it's really hard to finish a game, you know, um, because you got to win mainly through combat damage. And if you can, just can't get that final point of damage through, for example, because your opponent, you know, plays a moat and kills your flying creatures, 
it's really tough, but that's where the Drain Life comes in. Drain Life can just be that card that finishes the game, or it can be that card that kind of gives you that extra little life that you need to extend the game for one more turn so you, you can do it like your, your last alpha strike. So I really like that. What I also think is cool of this list, when I'm just, I'm just looking at the list now, is I see no Berserks. So there are no Berserks in here, which is, it's odd, right? Because I'm so used to seeing a Berserk or two in, in a green aggro deck. It is playing with three Giant Growths. It's also playing with three Pendlehavens. Like this deck doesn't need a lot of mana. So a situation that you can see here with Pendlehaven is that you have one Pendlehaven uh, on the battlefield. You have one Pendlehaven in hand. You're going to use your Pendlehaven to, let's say, for example, pump your script sprites, make it a 2-3. Then you play your new Pendlehaven. Your tap Pendlehaven you, goes out because of the legend rule. Then your new Pendlehaven is in, and you can use that Pendlehaven to pump another creature. Maybe you've got a second script sprite. So you can pump that script sprite to a 2-4, and you can attack for 4. So instead of you attacking for just for 2, you're attacking for 4 now. So that's something that I'm expecting to see from Rasmus. Um, in the sideboard, we see some Whirling Dervishes, and we see some Concordant Crossroads. I think those cards are probably going to come in after the first game, because Alex is playing with the deck, which is very defensive. It's usually quite low on creatures. So, I mean, a Crossroads is going to give you the advantage to gain the attack first thing. And if you get an early Whirling Dervish, it can grow re really, really big. And I think when you're the aggro player against the deck, you just want to put as much pressure on your opponent as possible. I actually think this could be a really difficult matchup for the deck, now that I'm looking uh, looking at this list. Actually, let's take a look at Alex's deck, and uh, then we can kind of form our opinions about this matchup. And here we see Alex's deck, so this is really the deck, right? I mean, last week we had a the deckish build with Sarah Angel and Mama Moti Jin, also like a dominantly white-blue control deck. Uh, but this is even more traditionally the deck. So what the deck wants to do, it wants to control the game, right? With disenchant, with swords, with counter magic. So it's controlling what's happening on the board. And in the meanwhile, it's slowly taking in card advantage through a Jam Day Tome, you know, through an Ancestral Recall, a Brain Geyser. It's got all the power cards, maybe a well-timed balance, especially against the deck of Rasmus, because Rasmus's deck is really creature heavy. So he's probably going to play out lots of lots of creatures early in the game. And then if Alex can get... Uh, you know, his hands on a balance and a well-timed balance can be pretty devastating for Rasmus. And then there are some win cons in this deck in the form of, of course, the Fireball. You know, really, just a really big Fireball at the end of the game. But he's also playing with four Sarah Angels. So again, just like the deck we saw last week, this has some beef in it. You know, which, which I like as I love com combat. And of course, we also see four Mistress Factories. Mistress Factories are so good because they kind of reward your passive gameplay, right? You're just waiting for your opponent to do something. And then you can use, you know, your, your Mistress Factory to maybe deal two points of damage when it's safe, or you just keep it as a blocker, or you just keep it to, you know, have an extra mana for your Gem Day Tome activation, for example. And the nice thing about the Mistress Factory is it cannot be countered. Now, in this matchup against Rasmus, I think the Factory is uh, very vulnerable because Rasmus is playing with uh, Scavenger Folk, he's playing with Crumble, he's also playing with Ice Storm, although I think he's probably going to Ice Storm other cards, but there could be some moments in the match, though, when he just wants to get rid of a, of a blocker on the side of, uh, of Alex, and he might point that Ice Storm towards the Factory. So I think in this matchup, the Factories are actually pretty vulnerable. And when we're looking at the sideboard here of Alex, there is not a lot of good sideboard material that he has against the Mono Green deck, you know? I mean, the Divine Offerings and the Disenchants, they're not really going to help him. The extra Mesa Viv is, but that's probably the only card. Maybe he could board in a Stone Rain, you know, against um, against the factories of Rasmus. But yeah, it, it, it's not looking really good in terms of the sideboard. I think main, obviously, the cards of Alex have more value, you know. So if he can, it's this classical matchup between control and aggro, right? Because Rasmus is really pl pr uh, playing aggro, aggro. Yeah, can I call it aggro, aggro? He just wants to, he's going to dump all his creatures really early. He's going to turn them sideways. This is going to be an exciting match. And Alex will really be, be stuck in a corner trying to survive. But if Alex can survive, he is definitely the favorite. Like, if he can drag this game to mid-game, he's almost already won it, you know? Because if you can then stabilize, he's going to get more value. His cards should be better, you know? So it, 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 he's going to get more value. He's got the power in the deck. He's got the Gem de Tomes to draw the cards, uh, you know? So if he can survive, he's the favorite. But I wonder if he can survive. I really do. Because Rasmus's list is insane. Um, it's probably inspired by some of the lists of Dave Firth Bard. He's known for his mono green list. He's known for, 
you know, trying out other varieties of mono green, taking out the urnum, putting in the little black cards in there to make it better. And these black cards, they have effect. You may look at it and think, okay, you got a demonic tutor, two terrors, drain life, who cares? But look at the results that these decks are now making at tournaments, this deck making it to the top four. It shows the power of that little modest black splash. Anyway, I'm more talking about Rasmus's deck now than about the deck of Alex. Before we go to the match, I would just like to point out, look at those cool altars. I mean, how cool is that Icy Manipulator Disenchant altar? That's just epic. That is, I love it. And the Fireball, the Mark 10 Fireball with the Juzam on it, and the, the Octopus Arms of the Mana Drain. Absolutely beautiful. And what about that Jam Day Tome? Man, just absolutely stunning. We've got the Vesuvan Double Ganger. What, is that a Black Lotus? Actually, could be a Black Lotus. Anyway, they're insane altars here in the deck of, uh, of Alex, absolutely stunning. But uh, we've talked about the deck of Alex, we talked about the deck of Rasmus, so that means we're ready. Let's go to the top four of the Often Troll Cup. Game number one here is about to begin of the semi-finals of the Often Troll Cup. On the left, we have the Mono Green. Well, he plays a little bit of black in there, player. It's an aggro stompy strategy, Rasmus, he's sitting on the left and on the right, We've got on the draw, Alex, who's taking a mulligan here, going down to six. He's playing the deck. So it's really aggro versus control, a classic matchup. And it's nice to note here that Rasmus's deck is a powerless. So that's pretty cool. Starting here with the Lanower Elves, Pendlehaven Lanower Elves, really good start for Rasmus. This is what his deck wants to do. There's a planes, there's a sword. So a quick answer by Alex makes absolute sense for him to take out this tempo play. And I'm, I'm predicting Rasmus to just play more small creatures. That's what his deck does. There we have one scavenger folk and a pass here, missing a land drop. So it looks like he kept a one land hand, which is possible with the deck of Rasmus. But I mean, it is nice to have some more mana than just the one. There's a swords. And maybe Rasmus was kind of counting on the Lunwer Elves to stick, but that's highly unlikely against the deck. Okay, he's found a land. There's a forest. Maybe we're going to see Argovian Pixies or... Nope, just a pass. This is really good news for Alex. Because this is giving him the time that he needs. He can play out maybe another blue source, keep counter magic up. He has, of course, already used two sorts to plowshares. Looks like he's really in the tank here. Thinking about what he can do. There is a City of Brass, so that gives him access to double blue. He is tapping out, though, taking a damage. What are we going to see? Oh, we're going to see a Mind Twist with a beautiful Often Troll. Oi, 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 altar on it. Remember, we are at the Often Troll Cup here in Leeuwarden, the Netherlands. He is taking a damage, so he's doing a Mind Twist for two. Regrowth and a Crumble. So that's pretty good. And it looks like the control player or the deck player is kind of taking charge of this game. There we see a Mishra's Factory tapping three. Are we going to see an Ice Storm? That will be quite nice. No, we're going to see a Spitting Slug, so a 2-4. Which is quite sweet to see a Spitting Slug in the semifinals. 2-4 creature from the dark. And it's actually pretty good. It's got good stats, you know, three mana for a 2-4. That's pretty good. In my deck, I play with Ghost Ship, which is a 2-4 flyer for 4, which is actually also pretty good. Alex here just passing the turn, missing a land drop, and this is giving an opening here to Rasmus. He can attack for 4, but it looks like he's going to do something else. There's the Ice Storm. Yeah, going to take care of the Tundra makes sense because you want to give him the city because then he's going to hurt himself, right? And with these aggro decks, those little points of damage that Alex is inflicting on himself could be crucial. So now I'm going to drop to 16. And I mean, what is he going to look for? Maybe Ancestral Recall to refill his hand, but that's going to take him another turn. It's going to mean one extra damage because of the City of Brass activation. Looks like he's thinking about maybe, is that a Strip Mine perhaps in hand? He could do Strip Mine, take care of the Mishra's Factory. But that is just a one-for-one one play. I'm expecting something more explosive. He's really looking at his hand. Of course, we don't know what's in his hand. And that's going to be decisive on what he's going to draw. Maybe, you know, maybe... I don't think there's a Black Lotus in his deck, by the way, or else he could have 
Maybe got a Black Lotus to cast whatever he's got in hand there. If he has an Ancestral Recall already in hand, he could even consider getting a uh, Mox Sapphire and play the Recall. But then again, if he had an Ancestral Recall in hand, he probably wouldn't have played the Demonic Tutor. He is passing the turn, so he's giving an opening again here to Rasmus, which is pretty good for him. He could swing in for four here. Which is actually pretty awesome, you know. He could put four, he could put him on 12. Maybe he could put some more pressure on the board. Who knows? Exactly. He's just going to swing in, put him on 12. Let's see if he can maybe play a Scrip Sprites. Oh, he's going to play a Giant Grove. He's going to hit him for seven. He's going to drop to nine. Ooh. That life total is going low fast. I thought, you know, when we were at the start of the game, we saw the early sorts to plowshares and the missed land drop. Okay, there's a balance. That's probably a card he looked up. It's going to cost him a land. Probably the forest here, I wonder. Ooh, he's going to go. So maybe he's got more spinning slugs in hand. Interesting. And of course, only two cards for Rasmus, so he is losing some cards here. So this balance is nice, but not that fantastic. And that's the thing with Demonic Tutor, when you're under pressure against decks like these, you gotta make difficult decisions. The most important thing here for Alex is that kind of, he stopped taking damage. He just needs time. And there's the pressure again in the form of a Scavenger Folk and an Elves of the Deep Shadow. So Rasmus wasn't over committing on the board, thinking maybe about that balance or a potential Wrath of God, so he was really finding his moment to cast those creatures, and now he's got pressure on the board again. Alex in trouble again, also because of the Pendlehaven, right? Pendlehaven can pump both of those creatures. So there's three damage potentially on the board. Taking a damage here, going to seven. What is he gonna cast? There's a recall. Taking back the balance, but again, I mean, it does mean he's opening himself up for another turn of damage, and he took a damage from City of Brass. So we can see another attack here. He could do three points of damage. Put Alex on four. That's exactly what he does. Tapping another green. Elves of Deep Shadow. Interesting. He's really saying to Alex, you know what? You just got to cast this balance. And Alex in the tank here, only having... Two cards in hand, so he could play it out, then he doesn't have to discard anything. And neither does Rasmus if he just casts the balance here, but of course he is going to lose a land. I have to say, I really like the Elves of Deep Shadow play by Rasmus, because if he would have kept it in hand, he would have had to discard it now anyway. And look at that, Alex is saying, you know what, I'm just going to dump the City of Brass, it's just hurting me too much. There's more pressure, and again with the Pendlehaven, it's so good. It's also flying, so it's got evasion. It's looking really bad for Alex. He's on four, and his big problem here is his mana base. Only two mana, two cards in hand. There's Swords to Plowshares, number three of the game, so he is finding the Swords. That's kind of what's keeping him alive. There we see the pump. Rasmus going up to 24, playing another Script Sprite. So I think what Rasmus is doing so well here is really timing when he plays his creatures and when he commits. There's the attack for two and a pass. Rasmus uh, dropping here to 20, no to 22. There's the attack, Alex on two. He's almost there. There's a lot of elves, no giant grove for a moment there. I thought he would cast a giant grove. The deck player is losing here. Game number one goes to our mono green, I wanna say hero almost here with underpowered Winning game one, now both players are going to go to their sideboards and we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two, here we go. So it's one up for the green player. Let's see what Alex, the deck player, can do. There's a Tundra and a pass. I think being on the play is good. Just gives you some more space, some more time. There we see a Script Sprites. And a pass. Are we going to see? Are we going to see an ancestral recall? I wanted to say, are we going to see a swords to plowshares? But an ancestral recall instead. He's going to fill his hand up. Now let's see what he can do with that. I mean, is he just going to discard, or probably we're going to see a land drop? 
and hopefully for Alex some mana ramping. He's playing with some Moxon, a Felverstone, probably a Soul Ring. Let's see what he can do. There's a Volcanic Island and a Lightning Bolt here on the Script Sprite. That makes sense and a pass. Seven in hand here for Alex. So Alex is finding the answers for the early pressure, but we saw in game one that that didn't uh, help him much. There's the Argovian Pixies. 2-1. Cannot be blocked by artifacts. And any damage dealt to it by artifacts is reduced to zero. There we see all the untapperty tap. Oh, there's a time walk. That could be quite nice. Could be a good tempo play here for Alex. If it was a time walk, of course, maybe I'm wrong. Let's see. Okay, it's maybe it was the Felwer Stone instead. So this is an altered Felwer Stone. And now we see the time walk. Okay, so it was a time walk. A beautiful double sign on the time walk, by the way, by Richard Garfield. And I believe Amy Weber as well, probably. Anyway, taking the extra turn. And that altar on the Felwer Stone is phenomenal. I love it. Absolutely love it. But this is really good for Alex, right? I mean, Ancestral Recall, having the bolts on the early pressure, now having that time walk and kind of have to tempo play with Felwer Stone as well. So it's double tempo, you could say. I mean, it's looking really good for him. There is a Swords here on the Argovian Pixies. I wonder if he's going to attack for two here. Well, going to attack for three <laughs> because he can pump it now. It's looking quite good. Putting uh, Rasmus here on 19. There's a Mace. Okay, you know, the nice thing about Mace in Rasmus's deck, you're mainly going to use it offensively, but it's also great to use as a defense player. I actually wonder if Alex is going to animate the factories. He probably isn't because you don't want to lose your factory to a crumble. And he probably has better uses for the mana. Oh, there we do see. So maybe now he is going to animate to put pressure on that. This changes the picture after that strip mine. It is still kind of risky though. But look at that. Four points of damage for Rasmus. Traditionally, as the deck player, you would much rather play out maybe a Jam Day Tome here. Or if you have double white, maybe a Sarah Angel. Or keep counter magic open. But then again, when you have the option... Looks like they're discussing a little bit about the uh, the life totals. Looks like Rasmus is here on 16. There is another maze. What is cool, by the way, if, if you attack with your factories into the mazes, what you can do is the one that he untaps, you can use it to pump the other maze. So it, it only saves you one damage as a defending player. That's exactly what's happening here, it seems. So he's got now going to crumble the other. Taking care of that may of that uh, factory. That's of course the risk when you attack with them. I think if you're Alex, you're just really hoping. Oh, a strip mine for another maze. If you're Alex, you're just probably hoping to find a jam day tome or just find something to draw cards. There's another green. There's an elves of the deep shadow. So uh, you can. It's a one one. You can tap it to give you black mana, but then you do take a damage. A card from the dark. Let's see what Alex can do. Looks like he's just gonna animate again and then swing for it, but then he's kind of inviting Erasmus to use that strip mine. I wonder what his hand is like. It's probably got no action in there at all. It looks like there's just a lot of lands. And remember, the green player is already a game up. If he's going to win this, he's going to go to the finals here of the Often Troll Cup. There's another Tundra and just a pass. I think there's just a lot of land there in hand. It's hard to see. I do see a Volcanic there in hand of Alex. There's another Maze. And a pass. Now, this is actually pretty good if you're Alex. You know, he's not doing anything. He is the, you know, if you're Alex, you are the deck player, you want you want the game to take long, so you're kind of in that mid-game position now, but we're missing some of the key pieces that makes the deck so good, and, and one of them is the Jam Day Tome. 
And just a pass here, another maze. So just lots of mazes here from the side of Rasmus. He's got no action going on. He probably also doesn't have a crumble in hand because then he could attack with the Elves of Deep Shadow, kind of lure Alex out of a uh, Mishra's Factory activation and then crumble. There is, there is a mace on the side of Alex. Okay, I think we're in for a long game. This could take a while. Of course, Rasmus does have the strip mine, but do you really want to use it now on the maze? I mean, I think you want to keep the strip mine, keep your options open. There is another Elves of Deep Shadow in the pass. And again, you know, the, the game taking long should be a plus for Alex, being the deck player. There is a Spitting Slug. So Spitting Slug is back. It's really cool to see the Spitting Slug having such an active part here in the semifinals. What would be good here for Rasmus, of course, is uh, finding a Pendlehaven and a Flyer. For example, the Script Sprites. And that's why in some of these uh, mono green decks you see Dragonfly being played. Two mana for one one flyer may not sound good, but you know, flying is very good evasion in old school. Alex having a lot of cards in hand there, but just no action it seems. He is playing with four Sarah Angels, but then again, yeah, oh look at that, he is casting a Sarah. The problem of course here, and the City of Brass in the past, problem for Alex here of course is the three mazes of if, that's just insane. And remember, Alex has already used his strip mine. I wonder if he boarded in that one stone rain from the sideboard. There we see a terror here on the Sarah Angel. But then again, if you're Alex, remember he's playing with one fireball. He could just continue playing this game and say, you know what, I'm just gonna wait until I got can play a fireball for 16. Who cares? And that's the thing, by the way, usually when you play a deck with not a lot of creatures, you know that all the creature removal, in this case the Terrors of Rasmus, are going to be drawn uh, to, to your Sarah Angels. So it almost feels like when you're playing a Sarah, it's just getting, you know, terrored anyway for two mana at instant speed. So it just doesn't seem like a very good card then. There we see a Chaos Orb. Chaos Orb could take care of something interesting here. The Chaos Orb is quite interesting. He is going to flip it. So he activates the Chaos Orb. Then we see the Divine Offering. Okay, taking care of it. That means also two more life here for Alex. Going to go up to 22. But this is really such a different game than Game 1. Where in Game 1 we saw early pressure from Rasmus that kind of forced Alex to have all those early answers. But it's completely different now. There's a regrowth. Looks like he's going to regrowth the Terror here. Interesting. I thought he would definitely regrowth the Chaos Orb here. But perhaps, you know, perhaps uh, Rasmus is like, you probably have, you know, disenchants. Maybe you board in some extra Divine Offerings. That Chaos Orb activation is just not going to happen. And I'd rather have a Terror against a potential Sarah Angel. But it does surprise me a little, because I thought if you have Chaos Orb, you could, for example, flip on one of the two factories, you could then use your strip mine for the other factory and then you can start attacking, which is what you want to do as a green player. There's the Argovian Pixies from Antiquities and an Elves of Deep Shadow. Look at all the creatures on the board. If Alex can find a balance here or Demonic into balance, that will be something for him. Let's see what he can do. He's thinking about tapping the Jet and the Felwer. So that's not a white spell then. He is counting as well. There is another Felwer stone. Again with beautiful art on it. I think that's the Pixie Queen. Really like... Alex has like really stunning altars. And here we see some action strip mining the maze. 
and attacking of course with the Argovian Pixies. Remember, Argovian Pixies cannot be blocked by artifacts. So those strip mines are not going to help Alex here. So two points of damage, Alex dropping to 20, so they're still pretty high, both of the players. Rasmus on 15. And despite the fact that this game is taking long, Alex is not in a good place. One of the things that Rasmus could consider next turn is attacking with everything, just gonna wait the blocks and how Alex blocks, because then he can use his Maze of If to take uh, the creatures out that are being blocked by the factories. The downside of this is, of course, that then he will only have one maze left to do something with. When Alex perhaps decides to attack with his factories. Then again, if Alex decides to attack with his factories, fine. Then, you know, Rasmus can attack with everything. So I think for Rasmus, it's really worth considering next turn to just attack with all your green creatures. Let's first, of course, see what Alex can do. But the fact that he needs so long to think about it means he doesn't have, for example, a balance in hand. Or does he? If he would cast a balance, though, he does lose his entire hand because Rasmus is empty, it seems. There's a balance. Okay, so he was thinking about the balance. Wow, this is huge. And I was saying that Rasmus has an empty hand, which is not true. He still has two cards in hand. This is a really good, a really good balance here. That's, of course, the risk of, of committing to the board. But then again, I mean, you play Mono Green Stompy, you got to do what you got to do, right? There's the pass by Alex. Rasmus starts building up again. Soul Ring and a Landerwer Elves in the pass. There is another maze of it. Wow, these mazes, they're just clogging the board. There's the pass. It's just really tough to get any damage when you're playing with these mazes. Is he going to tap five? I mean, is he going to play another Sarah? He kind of knows there's a Terror in hand, but there's a Sarah and there's the Terror probably. Or can he protect the Terror? Does he want to? He can protect the Terror and he wants to. Interesting, because I thought maybe he's like, okay, you know what? Sarah Angel and Terror, it is what it is. I'm just going to try to counter more relevant things because of those three mazes of if of course on the side of uh, Rasmus. If, if, if Rasmus wouldn't have had the mazes of if I would have understood this counter much better then again a 4-4 Sarah is also a great blocker against those small little creatures of Rasmus and it's a flyer so it can protect you from the script sprites. There we have the script sprites. But I mean Alex really seems to have it under control here. I mean look at his life total. He's on 20. That says enough against an aggro deck right? There's a scavenger folk in the pass. There is a pearl, a mox pearl. I believe all his uh, moxen are altered as well. And we see another scavenger folk. So again, Rasmus is kind of rebuilding. But it looks like the door is uh, jammed pretty, uh, pretty shut here by Alex. Having the mace, having the factories, having the Sarah Angel. He's going to tap five. Are we going to see another Sarah hitting the board? Another Sarah Angel? And a pass. So the problem here for Alex or those mazes of if, if you could just take care of that. It's one of the reasons I'm a fan of Icy, you know, it can tap down those mazes before combat. And like I said, he is playing a stone rain in the sideboard, but I wonder if you boarded that in. Might be worth it, of course, against a deck like Rasmus's deck, because you've got Pendlehaven you want to deal with, you've got Mistress Factories you want to deal with, and now also the mazes you want to deal with. There we see a terror taking care of one of the angels. And again, there's the pass, but look at all the mana on the side of Alex there. Let's count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 mana. So we can already make a fireball of 11. So he just needs a few more lands and a fireball to win this. And that's actually what I think is, is going to happen. Also because, you know, Rasmus doesn't play with counter magic. There we see a red into a soaring in a pass. Rasmus doesn't have counter magic. I mean, he's got the drain life, but it's pretty far-fetched. And 
the life total of Alex is just so high. Gonna tap the Felwer and the Jet. There we see the Demonic, so he can use the Demonic to get the Fireball. That's at least what I would do. Maybe I'm missing something, but that's what I would do. He now has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 mana. So he does need some more mana, but he's almost there. Look at the life total of Rasmus. He's on 15. He's also looking at the regrowth, it seemed. Or it seems. Three cards in hand. I mean, yes, you can then regrow the Ancestral Recall and, you know. I would, I would just, I think I would just go for the Fireball. But then again, I don't know Alex's deck and I don't know his hand, of course. We cannot see the card. I want to know what card he picked. We just don't know. That's the exciting thing about magic. Three. What's he going to do? Maybe a big brain geyser? That's also an option, of course. No, he's going to do a big fireball. But it's not lethal, so... But he's got a re- Oh, now I seem to get it. Now the coin is dropping. Perhaps he had Fireball in hand already. He picked up the regrowth. Now he can regrowth the Fireball. That's probably what he's going to do. Because I'm like, why would you play a Fireball if it's not for lethal? There we see an attack by Rasmus because he's... He knows what's coming probably. And he's like, this is probably my last momentum. He's going to lose the... Sarah here, interesting, exactly. Like one of the things that Rasmus could have done was use his Pendlehaven to pump the script sprites, then play the giant growth. But it's over there, we see the regrowth. Yeah, it took it took a moment, sorry Alex, it took a moment for me to realize you already had the fireball in hand. I'm like, why would you play a fireball, look up a fireball with Tudor, play the fireball if it's not lethal? But of course, you already had the fireball in hand. You looked up the regrowth, played fireball, and then the next turn, regrowth fireball, played it again. and. Yeah, I mean, I kind of saw the writing on the wall pretty early on in this match. I'm like, well, you've got full control, but you're just unable to put any dam damage through with creatures because of the mazes, so probably you're going to win it with Fireball. Anyway, uh, these players are going to reevaluate their sideboard choices, and we're going to catch back up with them in game number three. Game number three, here we go. The Decider. We've got Mono Green, well, Green Black Aggro on the play here. And look at that, a mulligan by the deck player. So he's starting with six, he's on the draw. It's looking pretty good, actually, for the green player, I think. I mean, being on the play for his deck is really good. Starting with a scavenger folk passing the turn. There, look at this. I do love this opener. I think it's super cool. Black Lotus. There, we see a Terra, though. Terra on the Lotus. A Terra on the Angel. And I guess this here you can see why that mini Black Splash is so good. I mean, if you're just playing Mono Green, the Sarah Angel against you turn one would be a huge problem. But the Terra, man, it solves it. It's solved, no worries. There we see a Whirling Dervish coming in from the side. No counter magic possible for Alex. He doesn't have to double blue. Now he does. This is a big problem for Alex here, actually. There's a swing. Taking double damage and, of course, a plus one, plus one counter on the Whirling Dervish. Whirling Dervish, a card from Legends, protection from black, and every time it deals damage, it gets a plus one, plus one counter. And when it deals damage to an opponent. There's another Whirling Dervish counter spell, though. That is a really important counter spell. Because it would have gotten out of hand very, very quickly. There we see a bolt. So this is really good here for Alex. He's on 14, so he's managed to get rid of both Dervishes. Scavenger Folk remains for some pressure on the board. Are we going to see a Spitting Slug now by Rasmus? Or are we going to see one? Just tapping a green, though, but more pressure on the board. Good news for him. Script Sprites, 1-1 Flyer in a Crumble. 
And that's good because you want to make sure that Alex cannot get to five because when he gets to five, he can cast the Sarah Angel. He's playing a full playset. So there are still three in his deck. There's an attack, two points of damage. Alex dropping to 11. There's another Scavenger Folk. It's looking really bad here for the deck player. Ooh, look at that, a Sarah Angel. No, another Terror, wow. Rasmus is just finding the Terrors. Alex is now empty-handed, taking three damage a turn, dropping quickly, now on seven. He's got three turns left. He needs something really good. And remember, he also has that City of Brass that can hurt him. Okay, this is actually pretty good. Of course, uh, Rasmus has that double scavenger, folks. So he can just attack with two here, exactly. Upon activation, he can use the scavenger. I would still do it, though. It's going to save you a point of damage. Exactly. There's the activation. Still going to take two because, of course... Uh, oh, going to take more. Going to take five. He's going to drop to two. Measly life. It's almost done. It's 99% done. What can save him here? Not even a balance can save him because of that Mishra's factory. What can he do? Of course... Okay, a balance could save him because he's got the strip mine. He could strip the factory... Play out a balance and he lives. Or does he have a fireball? Fireball is enough as well. Does he have a fireball? Oh, this is so cool. Fireball. I love it. But he is now on a one though. This fireball epic. I mean, he's still. if you're still in it, you're still in it. You can still win it. Love this. Scripps Prides though by Rasmus. There's the pass again. There's a bolt on the sprites, giant growth, and that's it. Alex saying, okay, this, this is it. You're winning this, wow. And that means that our green, black aggro deck, powerless, is going to the finals of the Ufton Troll Cup. And I mean, the Ufton Troll Cup, it's got like a hundred old school players playing in this tournament. It's a very competitive field and then to see a powerless deck you know, reaching the finals like this, this is fantastic. And I think, Erasmus, you can be very proud of yourself. And also, I mean, looking how the Terrace really, really did it for you in game three, that kind of, you know, underlines the importance of just splashing those few black mana and those few black cards. It makes this, this green deck so much better. So, uh, wow, just a fantastic semifinals. Next week, we will be back with the finals. If you don't want to miss the finals, make sure to hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. And if you're already a subscriber, thank you so much for subscribing to Timmy Talks. Please consider liking this video, commenting on this video, and sharing it on your socials. All these things are free and really help me move forward. They help the channel grow. And then there's one other thing that you can do, and that is become a patron on patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. And there you can support the channel financially as well. And the cool thing about that is that you're then really helping me as a content creator so that I can continue doing this stuff, go to tournaments, organize the live streams, make these videos for you. So please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. It already starts with just $1. And there are some perks involved with that as well. You get access to the Timmy Talks Discord, the online tournaments that I organize for my patrons and channel members, and your name will be mentioned in the end scroll. What end scroll? This end scroll. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the Thank you to Samba Kazik!